get going. Cooper's Hill. This is a poem you can see. It was first published in 1642 and then 1654. You've probably never heard of Cooper's Hill or Sir John Denham, even though you may have heard of like William Shakespeare and John Milton and some others. No, oh, and that reminds me, uh, people have, if you follow the Q&A on Canvas, you know that people noted that this iteration of the reader does not have marvels upon Appleton House. That was pulled out. Sorry, it's on the syllabus, but just read what is in the reader. Everything that we read is in the reader, so don't worry about that. Or I think um, there was one other small poem there. Oh, Man by uh, Herbert, I don't think it's in there, but I'll show that to you, so um, don't worry about it. And uh, I can tell you right now, what we're talking about in the beginning, just to give you like, you know, a, kind of a spoiler on it, is where modern nature writing comes from. You might think that nature writing has been around for a long time, and in some sense it has, but the specific characteristics of modern nature writing really begin kind of with this poem, and we'll talk about that. But first, let's um, take our first poll, and that is, did you find these readings boring? This would include Shakespeare, but some others as well. Um, <clears throat> curious, I have... Uh, Again, you know, I, I wouldn't select Sir John Denham's Cooper's Hill at all if I wanted it to be an interesting and fun read. It's just not. But on the other hand, since it does have, you know, a claim on being the first truly modern nature poem, it's important. So um, what do people think? Um, a little boring. Yeah, that's fair enough. And basically boring. Um, I get that. I get that. So, okay. Let's jump. So, Sir John Denham, Cooper's Hill. Um, surprising that you don't know it because it was one of the most popular poems in England in the 17th century, for sure. And this is another issue where we have to deal with the literal and allegorical thing because there's a big allegorical component here. And that is because it deals with something that happened right at this time in, 18, in 1649, which is the what led up to that, which was England's civil war, and then the beheading of the king. So it was a big deal, and that shows up in this poem. Interesting, you could talk, and books have been written about the allegorical significance of that, but not really of interest to us. We're going to go for the literal environmental interest, which is what we've done with pastoral. So this is it. Why are we reading Cooper's Hill? It's arguably the first loco descriptive poem in English. And so much coming after this, probably every, you know, nature poem that you ever read from like Wordsworth and all are in this tradition. So what does it mean? Well, we've had that loco thing before, right? That's from Latin and it means locale. So what is loco descriptive? It describes a locale. If you think about it, all nature poetry would do that. I mean, if you're describing like Wordsworth writes uh, on daffodils, he's describing you know daffodils growing in the Lake District where he lives. Um, and most modern loco descriptive literature has lush descriptions of specific locales. Um, it's going to become enormously popular. It's going to start with this small beginning, but it will then define nature poetry, not only in English, but really modern nature poetry in the West. So that's why it's so important for us to, to see. I mean, we could have started later, like with Wordsworth and the so-called Romantic Poets, but here we can see how it's coming on the scene and its features, I would argue, more clearly, especially when we compare it to art, which we'll do. Um, so you remember we had that remarkable poem, The Description of Cookham by Amelia Lanier, and kind of a companion poem to Penshurst by Ben Jonson. Those were so-called country house poems, but as you should know, they're more accurately would be called country estate poems. They didn't last very long. They come on the scene in the teens, the 16 teens, and then what happens is they get pushed aside by local descriptive literature. Uh, Sir John Denham is going to be kind of pushing aside and that text that's not in the reader that I have on the syllabus um, upon Appleton House is kind of the last of it. So it's a very short-lived um, 
genre is also going to lead to modern nature writing, but it will get pushed aside, supplant it, and ultimately kind of erased by local descriptive literature. And why? Because it's a more general purpose literature. So here's the, the basic idea. If you remember, both Johnson and Lanyer had to get a patron to pay them to make their poems. So Johnson got Robert Sidney, and he's the one who financed Penshurst. And in that older tradition, it's not that old, not that far away from this, that you needed a patron. That's how you made money. If you're an artist, you needed a patron. We are now moving into true print culture. And if you remember, and I'll show you when I click out of this slide, there are two publication dates for Cooper's Hill. That's because um, Denham sold these poems. You would go and buy a book and it would have this poem in it. You could buy it as a single poem. And it's kind of a funny story because it was, as I said, the one most successful poems in the, um, the century. What he kept doing is making it seem like he had a new version of it. And he'd add a few more lines here and said, ah, it's the all new version this year. And toward the end, he didn't have like enough creativity to make it newer, but he wanted it to seem like it was bigger and bigger, more and more pages. So he just, he kept having the, um, the printer make the font larger larger so that it looked like you were getting like 10 pages instead of eight, but really it was just a larger font. But anyhow, another significant thing, aside from the beginning of local descriptive literature, this is the beginning of a new model for writers. You don't have to depend on a patron. You can sell the thing to anyone. And if you think about it from the point of view of like writing a country estate poem, that frees you up because Johnson had to write about Penshurst. He couldn't, if there were, there could have been a, a beautiful, beautiful forest next door that he wanted to write about, but he couldn't do it because no one's going to pay him to do it. Johnson is going, uh, Robert Sidney is just going to pay to hear about how wonderful his estate is. But now writers, and Denham was one of the first ones to realize it, know that you can write about anything, anything that the public will buy, and you don't have to worry about a patron. That's why we're, that's suddenly country estate poems go by the wayside because patronage goes by the wayside. And here you can see the two dates, 1642 and 1654, two major printings of it, but there um, were a number in between. Um, <clears throat> it is local descriptive literature, kind of like country estate poems are a form of pastoral. We've been dealing with pastoral for a number of lectures now. Um, it's going to often eschew what we would say are the traditional uh, features of pastoral poetry. So remember someone noted, I mentioned in a lecture, you know, no sheep, no pastoral, that if you're gonna make a pastoral poem, pastoral painting, you have to have sheep there. Well, we're not gonna have sheep anymore, uh, sometimes, but um, it's still going to be about nature. It's about wilderness, it's about landscape. Um, and it's still going to principally focus on the landscape, which is interesting. And when we look at paintings, which we'll do in a few minutes here, you can see why this shift is a big deal, shifting away from anthropocentric issues of people toward the landscape itself. So um, it gestures this poem to a variety of environments. And just to be clear, and this is, this is a great question for the final exam, I guess, um, it's called a hill poem. This inaugurates a species of poem called a hill poem, just the way the description of Cookham and Penshurst created something called the country house, a more accurately country estate poem. This creates a genre called hill poems. And the interesting thing is, it's not what you would think about the hill itself. So you might think if you're writing about a hill, you have someone or a painting the hill or whatever, you have someone at the bottom of the hill looking at it, talking about the hill. That's not what this means. What it means is you're standing on top of the hill and that gives you an incredible vantage point to see the landscape just unfolding around you, like a panoramic, lands uh, panoramic landscape. And what it is is someone standing on top of a hill just sort of looking around and they say, over there, I see Windsor Forest. Over there, I see whatever. Over there, I see this washland and all. And that becomes, um, as, a, as a vehicle, as a genre, very important because writers will think, this is great. You can describe the whole landscape. You can describe for miles and miles and you don't have to worry anything about a patron or 
whatever, and people might really like this. So in this case, you see St. Paul's Cathedral, which is in London. You see London more generally, Windsor Castle, St. Anne's Hill, section of the Thames, Windsor Forest, and a Washland Meadow. And it's just, it's, it is panoramic. It's just like if you were doing this as a film, it's just like moving across. There's Windsor Hill. There's the Thames. There's, you know, Windsor Forest. So. Um, it's interesting because this particular genre gets picked up by what we would think of as nature writers. So they write about nature. Uh, but this very early one kind of writes about everything. So he writes about London, the city. He writes about St. Paul's Cathedral in the city. When this gets full blown over the next century and a half, you're not going to do that anymore. This is why it becomes like this definitive nature writing thing, because it's all about pristine or beautiful nature. Or if it's not totally pristine, then sort of pastoral. Um, and that's where people like Wordsworth are going to do it. And in Wordsworth's case, he's going to make that signature move of pastoral that he'll ignore the urban areas. He's not going to, I mean, urban areas are huge in Wordsworth's era. You know, the Industrial Revolution is full blown in his era and in an early sense. And he's not going to care at all about that. He's going to look to and indeed sort of fetishize and, and, and you know, idealize pristine rural locales. So this is actually the view from Cooper's Hill at the time when this etching was made. So here you can see Windsor Castle. And if you look back here, you can actually see that says London is far in the distance there. Um, it's interesting, it says something about the, um, the 20th and 21st century, that you can still visit Cooper's Hill, you can still see Windsor Castle, but you cannot see London, because London, even today, after it cleaned up a lot of its air pollution, after that horrible occurrence I told you in the 1950s, it still has a cloud of smoke there. And Denham talks about that smoke being there. But the interesting little trivia is people went up to Windsor Hill during COVID and you could see it. Um, because the air pollution was just that much lower because people weren't driving anywhere near as much and it was visible again for the first time. Um, yep. So it did inaugurate this um, hill genre. And again, you're here with the speaker or the painter or whatever kind of artist on the top of a hill looking out and around. And if you, this, this picture is fine, but it should have actually extended way over here because there's just a lot more that um, Denim draws attention to or gestures to here. Yep. Um, perhaps not surprisingly, local descriptive literature is often intensely descriptive. So the, the word to think about in that combo is not so much loco, the locale that's important, but the descriptive. Because you're trying to capture, like I note here between the boards of a book, um, the landscape itself. And as a consequence, it's more and more representational. And I'm going to flesh this out over the next few slides, but I'll just give you the first pass to understand it. And that is, if you, if you, if you have someone like Robert Sidney, um, you know, who owns this estate, you don't have to describe the estate to him. He knows it. You can just kind of like gesture to it. But now you're selling these books to anybody anywhere. So you may be selling them to someone in London, describing something that's, you know, like, um, like Shakespeare was writing about the Forest of Arden. So how do you do? So the challenge then is the person reading it has never seen the place. Robert Sidney saw the place every day, so you don't have to do anything there. But if you've never seen the place, you need to describe it really well. You need to put lavish description in so that if this were like, um, if someone were reading it, you could close your eyes and imagine the place even though you've never been there. And that's the big challenge for local descriptive writing and, and for the future of nature writing in, um, in English and the West, really. It's becoming, as a consequence, less representational and more gestural. So if you look at earlier writings, we're going to do this with painting in a little bit in the next series so you can see it. You'll see there's just not very much description there. It says over there, there's a hill, and that's it. 
a hill. What does that mean? It's no description. It's a big hill, small hill. Does it have trees on it? Does it have other plants on it? Does it have animals? The people live there? Who knows? Just a hill. But if, and increasingly, though, now we're going to see um, more mimesis, which is the word I use here. That's a literary term. It's the Greek word for representation. And description and representation in this context are kind of the same. And it just means that you describe more and more, more mimesis, more description. Um, you know, the earlier works, and to Penshurst is a good example, and I'll give you some line-by-line -line examples in a minute, it just gestures to what's there. It doesn't describe it. So let me let me explain that. But anyhow, that's the innovation here with local descriptive. It's more mimesis. It's more representation. It's more descriptive. It, it, it can't rely on you knowing what is being written about. Um, if you can actually visit the locale, if you think about it, representation is less important. So let me give you an example of that. And we have the examples with uh, the description of Cookham and Benzhurst. So in Penshurst, if you go back and read it, or if you haven't read it yet, it kind of works like a nature guide, right? And I, I mean that like a guide walking with you as you're going, you know, imaginatively going through this space. And it says, and these are quotes from Penshurst, look over there, the broad beech and the chestnut. Look, the purple pheasant with speckled sides. Look, the painted partridge lies in every field. Well, these are not very descriptive. I mean, what is the partridge like? It's a painted partridge. What does that mean? I mean, you know, it could be any kind of color, any kind of pattern, whatever. But if you're Robert Sidney and you own this uh, estate and you've had it for decades, you know darn well what a partridge looks like. You, in fact, it would actually be, uh, and I'll mention here in a minute, kind of irritating if you had a nature guide saying, look at the painted partridge, let me describe it, let me tell you all the colors and the pattern and all. You don't need that because you can look and see the partridge and the way it's painted. These are just very quick gestures. What kind of beech tree is it? It is a broad beech, so it's, it's a wide beech, that's all. Um, but again, you don't need these descriptions if you know the locale. If you don't know the locale, these are going to be kind of empty and worthless. It's a broad beach. Well, tell me more about this tree. I don't, you know, if you've never seen a beach, what does that mean? Um, there are some descriptions, like it is a purple pheasant, but what's important is what's gestured to that lies outside of the text, would, would, which would have been obvious to the owner of Penshurst, Robert Sidney. Um, and it's best if it, it doesn't overly draw attention to itself or its representational images. Sydney doesn't need that. He just needs to hear what a diverse, wonderful place he lives with these birds, that birds, those trees, whatever. And that's all Johnson gives him because it's all that's needed. And again, if you think about it, this poem, this piece of art was made for one person one person alone, Robert Sidney, and we would hope that he likes it or he wouldn't have paid Johnson for it. So Johnson has to write it for him, write it just for him. And, and also it should be clear, the um, images where, they're, where they are, they're gonna be over the top. It's like, you know, he wants to, um, I mean, what, what these are, are like, you've probably actually seen if you've watched like period TV shows or movies or something where, you know, you'll see someone has a, a, an estate and they'll have a painting of themselves or their partner or their children or their dog or something. And they're always incredibly overly idealized and wonderful. And that's why you'd commission a paint like painting like that because you wanna say, oh, this is my wonderful, beautiful, Beautiful family who look even more wonderful <laughs> and than they really are. And this is why you'd commission this poem because, ah, this is not my family, but this is my beautiful estate. This is how wonderful it is. So that's that's why you would you would do it. But that severely limits the potential that the, the writer has there. Um, and again, if the nature guide succumbed to the temptation of representation and just described it, it would it would be counterproductive. It would be irritating. I mean, what you really want someone to say is just what what um, Johnson says is, "Look over there, the painted partridge." And then there'd be like a moment of silence, you know, a mindful, attentive moment where you just stood and looked and took it in and enjoyed that moment. You wouldn't want someone to keep chattering on that. That wouldn't wouldn't really work. But it's going to be essential that a writer does that. You'll see with local descriptive. Um, 
And the reason this is important is because, again, Robert Sidney visits the, you know, Pennshurst estate all the time. But what if you have a reader or a viewer, if you're making a, a piece of art, who will never visit it? They don't know what a beech tree looks like. They don't know what a partridge looks like. Um, it's going to be important that you just keep laying on the representation, use mimesis more and more, and describe, describe, describe. And in that sense, they never need to visit the place. And um, kind of another spoiler we're going to get to um, shortly is John Milton's Paradise Lost, and it becomes a triumph of local descriptive poetry, even though it's just two decades after this, because he describes locales that you can never visit. He describes hell in great detail. He describes Eden in great detail. He describes heaven in not so much detail, but that's for a reason. But anyhow, how would you do that? How do you describe hell to someone unless you use incredible amounts of description? And to describe any locale, you have that challenge. So in a way, you know, you're you're kind of between the boards of a book, between the, you know, um, the front and the back of a book, you're you're actually squeezing an environment in there in the sense that there is this image of an environment that is created while you read it. Um, and hopefully it, it, you know, emulates the environment. Hopefully it's maybe not as good as actually visiting the place, but you read, you know, we're going to read one Mont Blanc by Shelley, another romantic writer, and most people have never visited that. It's the tallest mountain in um, in Europe. Most people have never visited, but the poem is so lush that you kind of don't have to. It's the um, maybe the next best thing. Um, now we have YouTube, but this was the next best thing then. Um, so <clears throat> I'm going to show you some images to kind of make clear what I've been talking about. And landscape first comes on the scene <clears throat> about the year 1600. This is right around when um, Shakespeare was writing As You Like It, Johnson was writing to Penshurst, Lanyer was writing the description of Cookham. And artists are increasingly interested in doing the same thing, um, trying to represent a landscape, not in words, but but in what we're going to look at on, on canvas here. And it it's interesting that this comes on the scene right right as country estate poems and then local descriptive. So let me show you what this means. Um, in the Renaissance, so this is earlier than this, so we're like maybe 100 years before um, landscape becomes a word in the year 1600, they make little effort to um, describe, to, to paint the actual environment. So let me show you what I mean. This is the Hunt of the Unicorn, 100 years before Shakespeare and Johnson and Lanyard are writing. Um, this is a landscape here in some sense in that these are trees here. Um, this is actually, if you look here, you can see the actual tree, it's a fruit tree. This is actually, this whole scene is taking place in a forest. But right off the bat, the human presence here is huge, and the animal being hunted and all, this is all huge. If you were to, you know, break this down into pixels, a large percentage of this scene is the human scene and the animals in the scene. The forest is there, just to let you know it's a forest, but it's not accurate. I mean, there, these are nowhere, there's no sense of perspective. There's no sense that these are huge trees. I mean, these trees should be towering above people, and yet how is it that these people are as big as trees? A simple way of putting it is, yeah, this artist didn't really care about the landscape or the environment. It was not about it. This is, in the terms that we've used, this is a thoroughly anthropocentric painting. This is a human painting about a human activity. And the landscape is there to let you know it takes place somewhere, but there's no real interest in the landscape. Remember, that's the year 1500. Um, 1450, a little before the crucifixion of St. Peter with the donor, more landscape here, but, you know, perspective has the people here huge. There's a church and a town, but there's landscape, sure. I mean, this is like a rock outcropping. There's a tree here and all. But again, 
this is not meant to be accurate. I mean, if you visit it there, I don't think it looks like this. This is very anthropocentric, all about the human activity, and this is greatly significant allegorically. But we don't have to care about that. All you have to know is not much concern for the landscape itself. So let's go forward a little. Peter Bruegel and the landscape paintings come out of um, come from Dutch painters. So this is a European thing. It spreads across Europe, but the the epicenter are, are Dutch painters. It will go to um, British painters and all as well too. Peter Bruegel is one of the um, the elders, one of the um, first. This is only sixty five years after the hunt of the unicorn, fifteen sixty five. 35 years before, um, you know, Shakespeare and all were writing what we read. This is the harvesters. Okay, right off the bat, what a difference. This is meant to accurately describe the landscape. This is not quite like a painting, but getting close to a painting. There's accurate perspective here. If you were to take these people, and if we figured out, you know, what percentage of the, the shot, you know, pixel by pixel is given to people, not a lot. The landscape is 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 taking control of this scene now. These people are leaning against a tree. That's probably a pretty accurate description of the tree. And the kind of the unicorn, the trees were like like a bush. They were just there. This is pretty accurate. These people are cutting wheat. That's the, what they're harvesting. Um, that's about the height of wheat, and that's what it looks like. So it's meant to be more accurate, but also it's very clear there's this increased interest in landscape, in the environment. And it's because of painters like this that suddenly in England, they start talking about landscape. They didn't even have a word for it before. I mean, they knew like fields and they knew trees and all, but to actually say, what do you call a scene like this? When I'm looking out there, what is it? It wasn't even quite a word for it, but then landscape enters the English language and it's landscape that's coming from uh, Dutch. That's uh, because that's where this originates. Um, the goal, yeah, is to accurately represent an environment on canvas. In the same way that, you know, local descriptive poetry, the goal is to accurately represent an environment in a book. Here it's to do it on the canvas. It's the same project, but you can see it here maybe a little more accurately. By 1640s and 50s, and this is when Denham's writing Cooper's Hill, remember 1640s first appeared. Um, it's now this landscape painting has spread across Europe. This is Claude Lorraine, who's French, and this is getting very close to photographic realism, right? This looks like a photograph. Um, it's meant to, I mean, the colors are accurate. The, um, representation of, of the plants, the size of them and all are accurate. Um, it's just pretty good. It's just pretty real. It's just very good. So, And you can see, by the way, this will flourish for a number of uh, centuries. And then you'll see there'll be a response in the 19th and 20th century where people are no longer going to be trying to do something photographically real. They're going to try to do some impressionist or um, some other form. But that's why, because you have this, you know, just incredibly realistic image. Um, here's another also by Claude Lorraine. Um, again, if you look at the the people here, uh, just a very small percentage, um, the, the castle or whatever it is here, adds some more human um, interest, but this is not anthropocentric as much as it seems to focus on the environment itself. And and that's what we're going to see more and more. And it's it, it marks a milestone because from this period on, we're going to see a greater and greater interest in the environment and its importance and preserving it and conserving it. And that will happen over the next centuries. But here's where you can just see it. It's on the scene already. Um, again, just um, note the human presence. Let me size this down a little. You can do this one too. Um, note the human presence again here. When you see it compared to these, it's just striking how it is over, this is actually from like 140, 150 years, um, it drops down dramatically. And just, you know, imagine if you can, and we're going to see how it works, literature doing the same thing. It's, it's, it's um, trying to describe landscape and doing it as um, accurately as possible. So, 
Um, and again, the hunt of the unicorn. Um, how do you? How can you compare the hunt of the unicorn with the Claude Lorraine here? It's just um, it's an entirely different type of thing, different project. <laughs> Here's the interesting thing. England is going to become more and more human-centered. What I mean by that is England's a relatively small island and England will have complete control over the island at this point. What I mean by that, not much wilderness anymore. There were some things like fens, which are like um, marshland and all, but even those, there's a concerted effort to drain those and make those into tillable land in the period. So it becomes <clears throat> this sort of um, example of what's gonna happen with the rest of the planet with respect to the environment. And that is the whole thing is under human control. Humans control everything. There's no mystery about you know what what is in that forest or anything. It's all been mapped. It's all known. It's all controlled. It's all being used by human beings, whether it's if not to graze animals, but actually tillable land to to farm and all, or for housing or whatever. The whole planet is the whole island is controlled. We are there now in the 21st with the planet. But here you can see the beginning of it. And once people get control of it and there's no more wilderness, there's nothing you know, like that, suddenly there's this sort of questioning of it. And nature poetry then is going to be celebrated more and more. It's kind of like the thing we, we talked about with environmental consciousness. Like, yeah, people in Santa Barbara know they have a beach, sure. But after the 69 oil spill, suddenly they see it as valuable and important and they start wanting to celebrate it and focus on it and all. Same thing here. Once the plant, once the island is under control, suddenly people think, well, wait a minute, what about wilderness? What about, you know, beautiful places like that? And that will be a preoccupation for the upcoming centuries, really. Um, so what is John Denham doing with local descriptive poetry? He's he's bringing to poetry, to literature, what Lorraine, Claude Lorraine and others were doing uh, in painting, and that's creating a highly successful representation. You saw, you could literally see it with the painting, how they were representing it more accurately, um, and writing is trying to do that too. And the only, the, the biggest thing that writers have at their advantage, so I mean, if you think about it, painters have lots of things at their advantage. They have perspective, they can match color, they can paint like the certain time of year so it's all accurate. You do all sorts of things, but writers have one major tool in their, um, in, at their disposal, and that's description. Just describe, describe, describe in great detail. So, you know, Claude Lorraine had that scene with everything in it. Well, if you're a local descriptive writer, you would spend pages describing that. We're not quite there yet, but it's the beginning of it. By the time we get to these people who are really fascinated with the environment, like the Romantic poets, they're going to spend pages. And you're going to see this with Henry David Thoreau, when you read of Walden. He spent pages, he spent pages talking about Walden Pond. I mean, someone else would just say, you know, at Johnson's era, Penshurst era, you'd have said, there, Walden Pond. And if you knew Walden Pond, you'd know it. But this is important because one, you can describe something that no one could ever visit. But if you think about it, it gives the writer enormous power. And the reason for that is if you were, say, like a proto-industrialist and you wanted to like strip all that land and get to the coal underneath, which was happening in this era, you would say, ah, it's just a field, it has some plants here and all. That would give you power because you could diminish the landscape and say it's not important, you know, the coal is important. The flip side, what these writers, what nature writers will do is celebrate it. And they will say, you know, we can't destroy this. This is something precious. And they will convince you it's precious because they're your nature guide. They're the ones explaining it to you. And you might say, well, there's just some bird over there. And they'll say, oh, no, wait, this bird is really important for all these reasons. So it does give them a lot of power and control over you, the, the reader, which is something writers always have. We don't tend to think about it that much. Um, it will seem sometimes, and we're going to see this when we get to Thoreau, that 
this local descriptive project is going to be so super specific, it's going to actually seem like nature writing, um, like scientific writing. And it'll be like, you know, if you're describing a flower, you'll talk about, you know, the number of petals and how the, you know, it's, it, you know, where the nectar is and all. And that's something that nature, that um, scientific writers are doing at the time, what they were called naturalists. And Thoreau thinks of himself as a naturalist as well as a writer or poet. So it is going to create a certain amount of tension because what is nature writing? Is it scientific writing? Because, you know, when you think about it, scientists describing what they see are, are describing nature too. What does the writer, in the sense of the poet, the person who, who wants to, to glorify it, who wants to use that position of um, power that they have, what's the difference? And when we get to Thoreau, we'll, we'll talk more about that, but just to kind of give you a, a rough idea of it. Okay, um, let's go to a little pastoral here. Um, again, with Ben Johnson plus someone named Catherine Phillips. Um, next role we're taking, poll. Um, would you prefer more female writers? Uh, I can tell you right now, Catherine Phillips is not just an important female writer, she's the most popular female writer in the 17th century in England. Would you prefer more female writers? So we're gonna, we've only seen really, well, we saw um, Sappho briefly, and we spent some time with Amelia Lanier, we're gonna spend a little time with Catherine Phillips. Would you like more of that? And the answer is yes, please, uh, for sure, or more would be good. And if you add those up, it's a huge amount. Um, and 14 people, 15 people don't see the need for more female writers. Um, well, in defense of that position, Here's the problem, and um, so I'm, 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 you know, if if I were clicking, um, I would have hit a yes, please too. The problem is that the kind of writing that we look at is important writing, not in the sense of better or more significant or more beautiful or a smarter person made it or anything like that. It's just milestone things. And as it turns out, if you're looking at pastoral, you got to look at a guy, Virgil. You got to look at a guy, Theocritus. If you're looking at local descriptive writing, you have to look at a guy, which is Sir John Denham. So that's, that's why there's not more of it. But um, I, I want to make you aware that there is more and more of it coming. And the, the final work that we, um, that we look at, which is Silent Spring by Rachel Carson, is really um, a triumph um, of work. But anyhow, uh, yeah. <clears throat> so Ben Johnson and Catherine Phillips write something called country life poems. Not country house, not country estate, country life poems. And they're translations of Horace's second epode. So Horace is basically a contemporary of Virgil. He's back at the um, right before the Christian era as inaugurated. And we, I could have had Virgil's um, um, second epode then, but I wanted to give it to you now, even though kind of we're going to be looking at a, a, a Roman poem here, but its significance is um, how it's represented at the time. So Horace, contemporary of Virgil. Um, the second epode seemingly begins as a celebration, it, it does begin as a celebration of simple country life, imagined as a literal golden age. So we've had this before, right? Pastoral, um, and does the same as like Eden or the golden age. It's a celebration of how wonderful life is in the country. And this, these four lines are the opening lines of the epode, the poem. Happy the man who far from all business cares like the pristine race of mortals works his ancestral acres with his steers from all money lending free. So happy, this actually will sometimes be called happy man literature because it talks about happiness. So there's a lot of talk about happiness in the 21st, like why it's important, how to be happy. Um, uh, Horace had the idea here too. How do you be happy? You go live in a country like this, free of business care. You don't worry about money and all that. You're like the pristine race of mortals. He's calling out the golden age. You're like the golden race, which we saw in um, Theocritus. You know, what are you doing? How do you spend your days? You're working your ancestral acres with your steers. So you're you're not quite like totally pastoral. You're you're working the land in kind of a Georgic way, but you're not into business or anything. You're just into living that wonderful life in the country. So, if you just read the beginning of this, you would think this is classic 
pastoral. This is not surprising. Horace and Virgil are writing at the same time. But it he's got a, a surprise here for us. Um, the ending reveals that it is a constructed poem. So let me just read the ending. So you saw the beginning. There's a bunch of lines in the middle, which you'll read. The ending then is, when the money lender Alpheus had uttered this. So you know now who is saying this story. It's Alpheus. Who is he? He's a money lender. He's a banker. At the very point of beginning the farmer's life, he called on all his funds by the end of the month, and the next month thinks to put them out again. So what Horace is doing here is revealing to the reader what we've talked about in this class, and that is pastoral is an urban art form. This, those opening lines sound like a guy living out in the um, you know, uh, country and loving it, but this was all imagined by an urban person, a banker named Alpheus, who thinks, I'm going to go live in the country and it's going to be wonderful and I'll be free of money lending and all the business stuff. And he's just about ready to begin the farmer's life. This poem is about it. And then he calls in all his funds. He's getting all his money together. He's going out to the country. And then he thinks, nah, I won't do that. And he uh, puts out his money again to make money for it. So what, what Horace is revealing here is what we now know, that one, pastoral is an urban form, and two, that it's a highly idealized version of the countryside from the position of the city and in this particular place. And he does it in such a wonderful way, um, because if you read it, you read the poem, read the poem, read the poem, it's like getting into one of Shakespeare's sonnets, you get to the last two lines and the whole thing is, is you know turned upside down for you. The whole thing gets turned upside down and he's... You know, at a time when people were writing pastoral like Virgil, he's saying, yeah, but don't be silly. This is all just a made up thing by people in the city um, like Alpheus, you know, imagining what they want. Anyhow, in the early modern period, this particular poem has an interesting history. So, um, well, first off, like Ovid and, and Virgil, you know, Horace knows that, you know, um, the golden age thing is just a fantasy. He's fully aware that the countryside is not a locus aminus and that it's culturally constructed. Um, something that we know today, but it's just provocative to think that even in one of its heights of flourishing, like with Virgil, that this was known. Um, and, you know, Horace just um, could have just written a tract on this, I suppose, but he he makes it into a very funny poem. Um, Ben Johnson, who we were just talking about, who, who writes to Penshurst, um, he does a translation of Horace's second epode. Here's the interesting, line by line, it's incredibly literal. He has that ending, and it's just, you know, it's, it's if you if you went to the library and you got a translation of the, of the Latin today, Johnson's is probably going to look pretty similar if you're trying to do a line-by-line um, -line translation. So Johnson doesn't see any need to change anything. But remember, he's writing at the very beginning of the 17th century, um, and it's literal. So Catherine Phillips in 1667, um, right about the same time Paradise Lost is published, she does her own translation of this, and she provides highly stylized version and she leaves off the ending and she if you think about it if you don't have those lines at the end it's going to seem like this is just a celebration of country life and how wonderful country life is and is not going to reveal that it's a parody her translation did not reveal that so let me explain why by telling you a little bit about Catherine Phillips <laughs> so um yeah, full stop. She was the most popular woman writer in 17th century England. We don't really hear much of her about her today. And that says something, um, yeah, you know, about the way the patriarchy works in the sense that these writers who were even at the time important were forgotten by scholars who were mostly men who focused on people like Shakespeare and Johnson and um, Herbert and Milton. And it's unfortunate because they've really erased her from history. And it's only recently that principally feminist scholars revived her. Um, but it is interesting because 
as a woman writing at the time, she was very careful about what she wrote. And we're going to see that with her translation of Horace in that it was not threatening or um, um, frightening in a way. So she does things like, for example, write poems because, again, she wants to get her message out. She writes poems about how wonderful motherhood is and how, you know, the, 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 the goal of every woman should be to have a child. And if you, when you read things like that, you would say, well, this is how she got to be popular. But if you read her carefully, there's, there's subverting of a lot of that going on. And historically, if you look at her, she's actually a very, very fascinating person. She's the center of a group of women who are, who are very, very close, who correspond, who actually have stronger emotions for each other than they do their husbands and all. And it's, it's been a case study for um, early feminist thinking in England for a long time. But there are other people like Margaret Cavendish. And Cavendish was known at the time, but she was not liked and she was not popular. She publishes a lot only because she was wealthy and she could self-publish. So she sidesteps the problem of needing a patron because she has money. She sidesteps the problem of, you know, people having to, you know, telling people what they want to hear so they buy her, which is something that Catherine Phillips had to do. Margaret Cavendish just writes what she wants. And she's remarkable. And um, people have, many people have commented on her actually over the centuries, but you could see the difficulty of a woman writing at this time. If you just wrote what you wanted to do, like with Cavendish, people would actually say of Cavendish that she was something wrong with her, that she was, you know, crazy. And that was the only way they could, could, could figure out someone like her. And, you know, uh, the Royal Society, which is the, you know, the, the premier scientific organization on the planet in England at the time, you know, Cavendish uh, dressed as a man and tried to go in there and got in and caused all sorts of problems. And she was just very much in your face. And I, I put her as a counterpoint because Catherine Phillips was not in your face. That's what she did. Um, she knew that the attitude toward the environment were changing, but she saw a way of, um, of, hand, of, of making something happen with that. So what she does is she gives the reader what they want. And in this case, it's unequivocal praise of the country life. It's like perfect pastoral. Um, you know, Horace knew that it was culturally constructed. Johnson, who translates um, Horace, knows that this over-the-top celebration of the countryside is culturally constructed. Um, but, you know, she knows that it's not a perfect locus aminus, that it's written by a bunch of guys living in the city. She also knew that London is increasingly having is a site of environmental devastation. So we talked about that already, where the second leading cause of death in London, right behind the plague, is urban air pollution, people breathing, breathing coal smoke. Um, she knows that, and she knows that now, as much as ever, people want to imagine a perfect life in the countryside. Does it actually exist? No. Horace knew that it didn't exist also, but she takes this as an opportunity to give the people what they wanted. Now, what they wanted was not an accurate view of the countryside. What they wanted was an over-the-top pastoral celebration of the countryside. And she takes the opportunity of translating the poem, and it's so interesting to see her doing it in the poem here itself, um, that she translates. Um, <clears throat> she, first off, she takes off those lines at the end I mentioned already. So at the end, you know, Alpheus, you, it's revealed that it's written by a name, person named Alpheus who's a banker. All that is taken off. Um, but she adds and just embellishes the translation with things that aren't in the translation at all. She makes stuff up and puts it in that, you know, what she calls country folk do not rule over anyone. So this is a government that's very equitable and fair. They don't envy each other's wealth. So, you know, Johnson wrote that thing into Penshurst about these big trophy houses. These McMansions are, quote, built for envious show. Not in the way Catherine Phillips imagines the countryside. Nobody envies someone else as well. And hey, they're vegetarians. They don't eat animals because people in the countryside have this wonderful relationship with animals. And we saw that already with Jacques in um, As You Like It, who was 
part of a growing number of environmentalists were on the, uh, I'm sorry, vegetarians were on the scene at the time. And Phillips knows that they're out there. And she says, well, that's what life is like in the country. Um, like Henry David Thoreau, they actually live in simple, small cottages. So it's not, you know, a bathroom so big you can play baseball in. And it's not like the houses imagined at the beginning of the Penshurst. They're simple cottages. Um, and they're in every way opposed to the city and the state. So big government, royalty, all that is not part of the country. It's a um, simpler life. To do this, she actually, it, this is like the least literal translation you can imagine. So Johnson, line by line, word by word, translates it literally. Here, Phillips adds 20 extra lines in. So she takes out the four arguably most important lines to reveal that the whole thing is a parody. And instead, she adds 20 more lines just going an over a top embellishment of the wonderful life in the country. Why this is so important, because Phillips in Phillips properly understands, perceptively understands what people want in their descriptions of nature, wilderness, landscape. And this is almost a blueprint for nature writing coming up. So, so I mentioned like Thoreau and Wordsworth and Shelley, I mentioned already today, they're all going to be playing out of this book. They're all going to be describing the countryside as this over the top, wonderful place where everyone's happy and everything's fine and it's all beautiful and everything is, you know, sustainable and wonderful. Um, and ironically, Phillips has to, you know, sort of take over this poem by Horace, completely rewrite it to make that happen. But she's perfectly willing to do it. And people would have read her version of the poem, and I, I would argue, found it so much more gratifying than Ben Johnson's because that's what they wanted. They wanted this view of the country as wonderful and great. And you're going to have decade after decade after decade of writers following her that are going to do just the same. And that becomes what you may have thought this course was going to be about before you got in here, which is it was all going to be like poems celebrating like daffodils like Wordsworth or Mont Blanc, this beautiful white mountain by Shelley. Um, but this emerges, that that writing is obviously real and all, but it it it, it actually comes on the scene at a certain time. And Catherine Phillips is a, is a major originator, I would argue, of it. <clears throat> she is a harbinger of, of generation after generation of poets who will fetishize the environment. Um, and some, like Wordsworth and Thoreau, will actually move there themselves. It's almost as if they actually buy into what they're selling. They um, Thoreau will move to Walden Pond, which is right outside of where he lived, just a mile out. And we'll, we'll talk about if that's a very big move at all, which it kind of isn't. And Wordsworth will move to the Lake District of England, which is kind of the most rural place, one of the most rural places in England at the time. He moves to a little town called Grashmere. Um, and what's interesting is um, with both of them, but especially Wordsworth, Wordsworth actually celebrates country life so much. And he's moved to this little town and he writes very specific descriptions of how wonderful this area is, the Lake District. He actually writes a guide, like a tourist guide early in his career because he needs money. So he writes a tourist guide. And then to his horror, people want to all come out and see it. And um, when they do, he's very worried that they're going to like trample it down. In fact, Toward the end of his career in the 1850s, they're building a, um, a rail line out there. So you don't even have to go to all the trouble of being in a horse and carriage for days and all. You can just hop in a train and go from London with a uh, change or two, and you'll wind up at the Lake District. And, and Wordsworth fights it vehemently. He writes a really impassioned uh, article in the newspaper saying, we can't let this happen. We can't let it happen. And yet, I would argue, more than any other single person, Wordsworth was responsible for it happening because everyone wants to, to experience this country life and they go there and, hey, maybe they even see it that way, right? Because remember in As You Like It, where the Duke gets to the Forest of Arden and he says, this is just a perfect pastoral place. It's a little cold, but it's just perfectly pastoral because he wants to see it that way. And of course, other people in that 
particular play won't see it that way but um that is the danger of of celebrating wilderness in the sense that people actually want to go there and if you don't believe that it's still happening um even this time of year try to go to yosemite sometime uh, you'll probably be in a traffic jam trying to get into it because people want to be there so milton's paradise lost two dates 1667 same date as catherine phillips's the publication of her translation of Horace's second epode. And then he writes um, significantly changed. So 1667 is 10 books, 1674 it's 12 books, but similar book. Um, from our point of view, this is interesting, right? Because it's what we'd call a reinscription of the opening books of Genesis. What I mean by that is Genesis, as we saw all those three books that we read, not very long, Milton says, I want more description there. I, I didn't get enough description of what was going on. You know, we do really, it takes place in Eden, but we really don't hear much about Eden. Satan gets put in hell. We don't hear much about hell. God's in heaven. We don't hear much about that. Milton reinscribes it and gives you all the description you could possibly want. Over 10,000 lines of poetry. It goes on and on. It's a pretty thick book. And it's, it's a retelling of the story of the Garden of Eden and the the fall the fall of the um rebellious angels but it's clever and milton like a lot of the people we read are clever and he's he's a very clever guy um because he's going to give you some very radical interpretations of christianity and radical interpretations of genesis so we saw like lynn white jr uh, being very frustrated with kind of the conventional interpretations of things like what it means to have dominion, Milton is going to come up with some very heretical interpretation. He's going to weigh in on things that we're not going to talk too much about, like the Trinity and free will, the nature of God, and the nature of women as far as being like evil and scripted seductresses and a host of other topics, and some that are interest envir interesting environmentally. In fact, Milton, Milton actually laid this book out um, in another work that he did, which was on Christian doctrine, which is this like um, prose work where he says, let me just talk about free will. And he goes on and on analyzing it. Um, he never published it. It did get published, but he would not sign it or let it known that he wrote it because it was so heretical. He knew that there was a good chance he'd be put to death for it. Um, so instead, he writes it all into Paradise Lost, and everything is there, the heretical stuff, but it's all interpretation. It's just like we saw with, with um, Pastoral, so that he can say, well, I wasn't really saying that, you know, the Trinity doesn't exist. Well, he does think it exists, but he can back away from it saying, well, you're just interpreting that way. It's not what I meant. But anyhow, let's get to the environmental implications of it. Um, Eden is a locus of Venus. But it's unusual right off the bat because Adam and Eve garden there. So you might remember in Genesis 3, 17 to 19, we had Adam's punishment for the fall. And that would be that he has to do labor, like hard labor, the sort of Georgic labor of tending to uh, the earth. And, you know, nothing's going to be given to you freely the way it was beforehand, according to um, to. Genesis, the, or the conventional interpretation of Genesis. But Milton says, yeah, I don't buy that because it's not in Genesis. I think Adam and Eve were actually in the garden for a while, and I think that God wanted them to take care of the garden. So if you read through it, you will see them actively taking care of the garden. So why does that matter? Well, it means that Milton's, Milton is saying, I've read the Bible, and I have an interpretation of Genesis. And in my interpretation, and I challenge you to say I'm wrong, dominion meant that human beings were supposed to take care of the earth. That's what Adam and Eve do. They are super serious about taking care of the garden. That's what I think God originally wanted human beings to do. That's what I think is the relationship that Christianity has to the planet. And we saw that already emerging at the beginning of this century with Amelia Lanier, the notion of Christian stewardship, that homosocial group of women on the Cookham estate who took care of it. Milton says that is his interpretation of Christianity. Human beings are here to take care of the planet. God has entrusted this planet to us, and we should be taking care of it. That's a radical thought um, at this time in you know 1670. It will become 
a standard in the 21st. And it even, it emerges up until then, but certainly people like Al Gore and Pope Francis, the sitting Pope, they're totally in that tradition. They're Christian stewards. They believe just that, that their interpretation of Genesis is the human beings were given the earth to take care of. And if we don't do a good job of taking care of it, God is not gonna be very happy with us. That again, 350 years ago was a very radical thought. One of the kind of thoughts that Milton was worried would get him killed if he came out and said it. But today it has become a mainstream Christian thought among certain groups. I mean, certainly um, that's Pope Francis's thought. Other people will argue that of course, but um, it is certainly a strain of Christian thinking and, and, and a strong environmental strain of it. Um, Milton actually goes to great length to portray Eve as the genus Loki of Eden. So, you know, we had Hom Baba, who was this protector of place. Milton, Milton has, you know, he reads seven languages. He's read everything you've read in this class and a lot. And he argues that um, he, he writes Eve to be the protector of Eden. And that's interesting right off the bat because he doesn't write Adam and Eve. And Adam is actually kind of adult here, and Milton is going to play up that Eve is um, is basically the brighter of the two, and he's going to completely rewrite. We're not dealing with it here because it's an environmental class, but um, the notion that, for example, in Christianity, that women in the form of Eve or the problem that their seductresses and all and the fall is all caused by sex in some way. Milton doesn't buy that. So his interpretation, and he, he writes it very cleverly, he has them before the fall having sex a lot. And right off the bat, you would say, well, then sex couldn't have caused the fall because they're having sex already. The fall must have been caused by something else. Sex is not a sin, not a horrible thing, the way people are saying, but rather something that God intended. Um, that's a provocative thought, too, that would, would get Milton in trouble, no doubt. But anyhow, Eve also, in addition to, you know, Milton... Um, getting her off the hook for that very, you know, um, misogynistic interpretation that had been in place for many hundreds of years. He also has her taking care of the garden. She nurses the plants. She takes care of the place. Um, she's very worried about things that could happen at night to the garden. Every morning she gets up specifically very early because she wants to take care of the garden. She's like the ultimate conscientious person. So God said, we're gonna take care of this place. I am going to get up extra early and I'm going to take care of it. And it's clear Adam doesn't do any of this. So it's provocative because, you know, um, this is a different portrayal of women than we've had before. And she is also, we talked about dualism, you know, like being preoccupied with the celestial, you know, metaphysical realm. Um, Eve is preoccupied equally with both. Milton, Milton goes to great lengths to, to sort of underscore that. So yeah, does she care about, you know, this basic Christian thing of a metaphysical realm? Sure. But she cares as much about the earth easily. Her preoccupation is with the earth. And we're going to get to that in a minute with dualistic thinking. Um, so remember that Lynn White Jr. and others have argued that Christianity is inherently dualistic, right? We had that during, was it lecture five, where I had that line across the, um, the screen the whole time. And there's the physical realm down below, which is not as good in the metaphysical realm. And Christianity in Saul, that's the way the universe is constructed. And human beings are the, the one creature that is between the two, right? We have a physical body, but we sort of pop out of that body as a soul and go up into heaven. That's called dualism, of course. Milton, and again, heretical point of view, is a monist. He doesn't believe that we are split. He doesn't believe that we have a soul and a body that are separate. He believes that we are all, he says, one matter all. Um, and, you know, um, to Milton, you know, he, he even goes further in saying, not only are human beings one thing, body and, and spirit combined, but so is heaven and earth, or at least it originally was before the fall. And that's a radical thought because there is no metaphysical realm in Milton's view of Christianity. Heaven 
and earth are made of the same thing, one matter all. And he even goes further, and I'll get to it in a minute. He even says that if the fall hadn't happened, what Adam and Eve were supposed to do is do such a good job of taking care of the earth and all their children would have helped and children's children and all, that earth would have been made into heaven and then heaven would be earth. There'd be no longer a distinction between the two. So it's, it's a radical, um, it, it really is a deconstruction of metaphysical dualism in the West. And it's one of the earliest and most um, complete um, he argues that that boundary that I drew, that line between the physical and metaphysical, he says, nah, that's not in Christianity. Um, I've read Genesis. I'm going to tell you the story of Genesis. It's just not there. And he goes right out and says in other works, that's from Greek and Roman thinking. You know, people that we've idolized, like, you know, Socrates and Plato, which at the time would have been idolized, he says, you know, they, they created this problem. That's not Christianity. Christianity to Milton is not inherently a dualistic religion. It's, it's just an incredibly provocative thought. And I, I can't like underscore how, how radical that is. Um, so you have um, Satan in Paradise Lost in book one. He says, the mind is its own place and is itself can make a heaven of hell or a hell of heaven. Um, this is actually a boast of contemporary metaphysical thinkers like Rene Descartes, who would really put metaphysical dualism on the scene in a, in a modern sense or, or an early modern sense and saying basically that, you know, I am separate from this place. Wherever I go, I can be separate. I am not connected to the place. The place is separate from me. Um, but he realizes, of course, that he's never separate. Wherever, which way I fly is hell, myself am hell. Um, he, he scoffed at his Satan and Descartes, um, saying that the mind can pull free of the body, the earth, and indeed the entire physical realm. To him, you are always connected to the physical realm. You are always in nature. You are part of nature. You're part of the ecosystem. You, you, can't, you can't break free of that. Um, and this is the remarkable statement. It's not like you reside in your body. So in the traditional dualistic view, you're a soul that's in the body. The body is some kind of even called a vessel. It's like a bottle. You're in the bottle and you know you pop the cork when you die and you go up to be with God, hopefully. Not to Milton. You don't live in your body. You are your body. There's no difference between your soul and your body, your mind and your body. You're connected. And he goes further and says, you know, you don't live in a place. It's not like you just are here. You are that place. You are connected to it. And this is a radical thought. And when we get to, which I hope we do, lecture 17 with Buddhism, we'll see that this is, that existed in that tradition for thousands of years. But only here does it start coming into the Western tradition, saying things like, we are not split beings. We are connected, and we are not just connected with our bodies. We are our bodies, but we're the place as well. Um, yep. So let me just go. We have uh, just two more slides, and we'll be done. Um, Milton then very obviously interprets the Judeo-Christian Bible differently from like John Dunn. Remember Dunn argued the world is but a carcass. Forget this world. Think of it as like old clothes cast off a year ago. Milton doesn't buy into that. He says, you know, eschewing mind, body, and spirit, flesh, dualism. He argues that there's a possibility of regenerative Christian era here and now on earth. So that's a remarkable statement because remember, everyone else thought that at the fall, everything is now decaying on the planet. The only thing that can be saved at the end of time are human beings and only those that are faithful. Milton says, maybe we can regenerate this whole planet. Um, this debate continues today, and I alluded to it before, um, John, uh, James Dobson, uh, the um, person who created Focus on the Family, called on an evangelical leader to be fired because he said that climate change would be taken, you know, seriously. Um, it does raise the question of how much value we put on the earth, whether it's something we just say that doesn't matter because it's going to end at the end of time, or whether we take this notion of stewardship seriously in a Christian sense and try to save the planet and try to rebuild the planet. Um, and that, of course, is what Al Gore and Pope Francis and many others are doing. Okay, so here, this is a really uh, serious question. I'm kind of curious what you think of it. Um, do you think that 
the end of time is coming, coming. So millennial Christian thinkers have been thinking for a long time. Um, what will happen with climate change? Do you think we were going to be able to turn it around? We're not. I am, I am really anxious to hear what you believe. Here we go, 500. Yeah, yeah. Um, whatever it's worth, I would answer B also because I'm, I'm not quite sure, but let's hope so. Yeah. I am sympathetic with the 100 people who feel that the era of human beings is coming to an end on this planet. I hope you're wrong. 